All right, good morning, beloved. Turn with me to Galatians again. This is going to be a good study because we're studying the Word of God. That always makes the study good, doesn't it? Galatians chapter 1. I want you to get that in one hand. I want you to get Acts chapter 9 in the other. We're going to bounce back and forth between these two uh, just a little bit. We'll be in Galatians 1 and Acts chapter 9. And uh, let's go ahead and pray now. Father, you know what we have need of today. Give me the gift of teaching. Help our ears to be open, tentative to your word. Understand what it has for us as we study even the minor details, things that we just pass over sometimes. Help us to gain a deeper understanding of what your word is saying and what you're communicating to your people. Father, bless us now. We ask it in Christ's name, amen. Just to refresh you, when we were last together, uh, we looked at Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 17, and that was Paul's defense of the veracity of the gospel. It was not a message that he came up with. It was not a message he learned from human teachers. It was not a message that he would constructed so that he could please men. You remember that was an accusation that seemed by implication of what he's saying to be being made against him by those who came down to accuse him. And Paul contrasted this revelation from God with the religion of man. You remember that? Um, And he was was formerly enslaved to the religion of man. Excuse me, I'll get my mouth together here in a minute. He was formerly enslaved to the religion of man. And he was enslaved to first century Judaism version of religion of man, uh, Phariseeism in particular, and all of that. That was the religion of man that he was associated with, but that's not the only one that there is. We know that there are many others. They're all over the world. Uh, They're in buildings that are called churches. They're in buildings that are called synagogues. They're in buildings that are called mosques. Their religion of man is everywhere. Is everywhere. It's permeated the culture. And really, it's not just the religion of man, but it's the religion of the Antichrist, because if the Antichrist can get into religion, he's always going to spoil faith, and he's going to turn you to your own righteousness and help you feel as though you can do well enough. We know that's not the case. But James tells us that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You remember Paul in Galatians chapter 1 and 4. He says that Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father. And we'll eventually get there in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. He says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom, note this, the world is crucified Unto me and I unto the world. Now, it doesn't make the... I don't think that you have to read a whole lot more of what Paul says to understand his point. Uh, To understand that he is trying to not present to the Gentiles. And this is the accusation that he is giving the Gentiles something that is palatable for their Gentile lusts and their Gentile desires, that, oh, you don't have to keep the law, and you can just not worry about that, and it's not a big deal. That's not what Paul's doing here. And I don't think Paul can make it any more clear than in in, in the fact that he says that he is crucified unto the world, and the world is crucified unto him. And the lust of the flesh and all of those things that are in the world those things that are passing away, First John tells us, um, those are not the things that, that Paul is trying to make palatable, saying you can go ahead and continue in your sin. It's not what Paul's saying at all. He's just saying you don't start off by saying, let me stop doing something to get in. How, how many times do we, do we hear the preacher say, don't get cleaned up to come to church to, to get right with God? In other words, don't wait until you're doing well enough 
to feel like you'll be accepted at church. You need to come to church recognizing that nobody in here is accepted of their own will. He made us accepted in the beloved. Now, you may disqualify yourself from the fellowship of the saints because you're an open, unrepentant sin. In other words, the body protects itself, and you're not allowed to come in and just, you know, you're not going to come in here drunk all the time. You might come in here drunk once or twice, but you can't keep doing that. You're not, you, you can't participate in the fullness of the joy of the believers if you're living in an open, unrepentant sin. If you're fornicating, I mean, you're not going to have joy around Christians anyways. Whatever, whatever smiles you have will be a put on. If you're shacking up with somebody, you can't have joy in that. There's no joy and comfort and peace in that. So we, anyway, I don't want to get off into that. But Paul is making this point very clear. And he moves on from a defense of the veracity of the gospel to now he's going to give a defense of his apostolic authority. A defense of his apostolic authority. And he does that by way of giving an autobiography. And so we're going to study a bit here about Paul's early years in Christ. And in this section of his defense, it really extends from chapter 1, verse 11, all the way down to chapter 2 and verse 14. Uh, but I have too much to say and not enough about everything in each one of these verses, but there's too much to say to, to take on all of that as one big whole, so we're just going to try and get through the end of chapter 1 at this time. So, let's see. Look with me at verse 15, just so we can grab the full context of what we have here before us. Verse 15 through 24, we're just going to read this aloud. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw, and none save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which, pre he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which he once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me." So I want, I want us to go ahead and pick up here in verse 17. We have Paul's education here in Arabia and his second visit to Damascus here in verse 17. And that's going to pull us right over there to Acts chapter 9. So just go ahead and flip over there. Acts chapter 9. Here's what it says here in verse... Um, verse 18, we see that he is healed. The scales fall from his eyes. Um... He receives his scythe forthwith. He arises and was baptized. When he had received meat, he was strengthened, in verse 19. Then Saul certain days with the disciples. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. So um, he's there with the disciples at Damascus, and he is being ministered to. But not only that, not only are they ministering to him, but he begins to minister to those around him. Then uh, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. I, I want to talk real quick right here about the importance of an education. Um, when, I, when I was growing up as a young preacher um, over a decade ago now, um, I think I've said this before here. I was not too impressed with seminaries and Bible colleges. And I kind of mocked and I, I made fun of that. And I'm ashamed of that. That's not what we ought to do about someone pursuing an education in the scriptures. Now, there are good Bible colleges and there are wicked Bible colleges. Not good and bad, good and wicked. There's not some that are in the gray area. It's, you're either good, you instruct men on how to become preachers of the word of God or you 
are wicked because you don't really care about the preaching of the Word of God. You care about presentation. You care about pomp. You care about circumstance. You care about all this other stuff. But Paul here, Saul, excuse me, at this point in time, he receives an education. His education begins with his first vision of the Lord Jesus Christ there on the road to Damascus. And what does he do? With that, what does that tell him? What does that instruct him? Well, we see here that straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Immediately, Paul is overwhelmed with the sense of his understanding of who the person of Christ is. And he is going to get heavily into the work of the person Christ, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but right now he is worried about the person and who he is in his deity. I want you to note this. Satan called the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God in Matthew 4, 3. The disciples recognized him as the Son of God when he walked on the sea in Matthew 14. The high priest called him the Son of God in Matthew 26, 63. Not because he agreed that he was, but, he, but, but because he knew that he was professing himself and making himself to be the Son of God. Now, that was a profession that was a full possession as well. But he was saying that. Unclean spirits fell down before him and confessed him as the Son of God. John the baptizer bare record that Jesus is the Son of God. Nathaniel confessed this. Jesus claimed the title himself in John 3.18. The Ethiopian eunuch confessed this truth uh, there when he was with Philip and he was uh, converted and baptized. So it makes sense that Paul would preach Jesus as the Son of God, and he knew that, that what that meant is that Jesus was divine. The Pharisees may not have understood it, but I'll tell you who understood it. Satan understood it. The demons understood it. The apostles understood it. And Christ understood it himself. If you believe not that I am he, what's going to happen? You're going to die in your sins. You're going to perish. So it makes sense that Paul would preach this same truth about Jesus, that he is the Son of God. And furthermore, Luke records in verse 22, but Paul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving not just that Jesus is the Son of God. He's not just preaching that he is God in the flesh, but here he preaches this, proving that he is the very Christ. That he is the Messiah that they've been looking for. He is trying to open their understanding that they might see you have crucified not only the Lord of glory, but you've crucified your own Messiah. That this same Jesus is the, is the Lord of glory and your Messiah and you have crucified him. What is wrong with you? Paul needs a little bit of grace and he'll, he'll, he'll grow in that measure. But here he is just confronting them, he is confounding them, he is rebuking them, and he is proving to them the truth of who Christ is. The Lord Jesus will not be lowered or um, uh, put, on a, uh, put on a lower standard or standing in their eyes. He is going to lift Jesus up high and lofty. He is divine, he is Messiah, he is Christ. Note this, he first comes to Damascus with what? A letter. And by the time he leaves, he's had the Spirit. Isn't that interesting that he comes with a letter and what does the letter do? The letter kills. The letter condemns. The letter cuts off. The letter curses. But by the time he's leaving, he's preaching the truth of the Spirit. And understanding that in the Spirit we can have freedom. The curse can be reversed. That the bondage can be made freedom. And what a, what a great and glorious truth that is. His preaching is so fierce that they have to get him out of Damascus to avoid his death. As they're seeking to kill him. From there he journeys into Arabia. And in Arabia he receives further instruction. And that's the location of Mount Sinai. And it is in Arabia that he receives personal instruction from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we don't know. There are people who will argue with you one way or the other. We can't know for certain what the truth is 
But we'll know in heaven, and that'll be good enough for me. But we know that this span of time, his period in Damascus, then his time in Arabia, and we're going to see that he goes, Paul says there in Galatians, uh, that he went into Arabia in verse 17 and returned again unto Damascus. So he goes into Arabia, returns again into Damascus, and that that period of time from the time of his conversion, him going into Arabia... And then him returning to Damascus, that's a three-year period of time. Now, we don't know the breakdown of that, how much time was spent in Arabia and how much time was spent in Damascus. Uh, But I'll tell you this, that it it doesn't take long for Paul to get somewhere early on in his ministry that people want to kill him. I don't think that many preachers understand that these days. And I'm going to be frank with you, I don't think many church members understand that these days. I have people look at me cross-eyed when I tell them I go street preaching. What? You're one of those people. Well, yeah, so was Paul, and so was Jesus, so was Peter, and so was the other apostles. I'm like, are you ignorant of the scriptures? I don't mean that coarsely, but are you ignorant? People look at street preaching and they say, that's just a, that's just a weird group of people. Yeah, that's okay. I'm, I'm glad to be associated with that weird group of people. Not all of them, because not all of them are good, right? There's good and there's wicked. There's righteous and there's ungodly. And that's the truth. But, but here's the thing is that Paul is a preacher. That is Paul's burden. That is Paul's calling. And that's what he's going to do. He has to be taken out of there. And so um, while he's in Arabia, I know that he's being instructed by the Lord, but, but who else is in Arabia? All right, that's not a trick question. We are Americans. We live in America. (laughs) Arabians are over there. (laughs) He's the apostle to who? The Gentiles. Well, here you got got some uh, Gentiles in the sight of the Jews. And so what's he going to do with them? I I mean, some people would argue with you that he spent three dedicated years in solitude being ministered to by the Lord Jesus Christ. But I tell you what, when I've got a message and it's shot up in my bones, I can't wait three years to get it out. I'll die. I'll just die. I'll just, I'll just shrivel up. Now, I guarantee the preacher would say the same thing. When you've got a message on your soul, you've got to get it out. And what was his message? What was his burden? That Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. And he's seeking to win souls for Christ. And I think that's what he did for a good portion of his time in Arabia. No matter what amount of time he spent there in Arabia and Damascus, that's what he's doing. He is preaching mightily, convincing, persuading men of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And we move on from there in the broad sense. While he's there in the place of the giving of the law... um, he receives instruction from the Lord Jesus Christ on what the law is and, and how the law is to be used and, and the purpose of all of this. And in a broad sense, the law represents all of the Old Testament. So now he understands that the prophets in their prophecies about Messiah were pointing to who Christ would be. In the wisdom literature, they're pointing to the wisdom of God. That is who Messiah would be, the very manifest Uh, incarnate wisdom of God. In the law, we're understanding that the law, here's what he understands about the law, is that the law, the five books of Moses, I'm talking about the Torah right now, that the Torah points people to Christ. There's many, I mean, there's a ton of references I could hit right here, but we don't have the time for it. You think about Isaiah 53, though. That's the prophets. That's who Christ is. He's the suffering servant. Uh, You can go throughout the Old Testament and find types and pictures and and pointing to's of the Messiah. There's over 350 prophecies about the Messiah. And I love this little point we pointed out in the men's um, prayer breakfast that Isaiah, he holds over one quarter of all of the prophecies about Messiah. And he holds over one quarter of of his prophecies about Messiah in Isaiah 53. I mean, there's a lot of prophecies about Messiah, but in Isaiah 53, it is abounding with prophecies. 
There's 35, some count 37 prophecies about Messiah in Isaiah 53. And they're all fulfilled in one man. One man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul sees this. So in the Torah, the writings, and the prophets, Paul now sees that it all points to Christ. But after some time there in the desert in Arabia, however long that was, he goes back to Damascus. And it's so fitting, as I said, that he went there originally with a letter. He leaves with the Spirit. He doesn't come back with a letter again. That's the problem that the Galatians had. They had been converted from the letter to the Spirit, and they went back to the letter. But Paul lays out an example of you, you, you start in the flesh, um, or, or you are in the flesh, and then you get made whole in the Spirit, and you don't go back to the letter. Paul didn't go back to the letter. The apostles, when they go back to the letter, what happens to them? They're rebuked of God. They're rebuked of God uh, directly by God, or they're rebuked of God by their other apostles, by Paul in particular, and we'll get to that in Galatians 2. Turn with me to uh, Acts 9, verse 26. Luke's going to pick up this narrative here, and I hope I'm not going too fast for you. I hope that you're gaining an understanding of the context here so that this will be useful for you in your own personal study. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. Note what it says here, but they were afraid. They were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. So Paul's preaching in Damascus was so powerful. He did such a good job of convincing those in the synagogue that Jesus was both the Son of God and the true Christ that the unbelieving people wanted to kill him. But when he goes to Jerusalem, it seems... Uh, to be as he's trying to join himself to the apostles. Why, now, why is he doing this? He wants to have their fellowship. Saved people want to have fellowship with saved people. He wants to have their fellowship, but he also wants to have a confirmation from them. Now, he didn't go immediately to Jerusalem. He was not worried immediately about being uh, uh, um, accepted into the uh, fellowship of the apostles. But now, after three years of ministering and being ministered to by the Lord Jesus Christ and preaching the truth of who Jesus Christ is, now all of a sudden he says, I need to go up to Jerusalem and make myself known to the apostles so that we can all be on the same page. So that they can know who I am and what I am for now. Do people who you're around know who you are and what you're for? And I don't mean that you're the person who annoys and, and, and is a pest to everybody about your faith. But I mean that when they got something wrong in their life, they know who to go, they know who to, go to and ask to pray. Not just that you're shoving Jesus down their throat, but when they're actually hurting, that you have done such a good job of representing the gospel, that when they're hurting, they come to you and they say, you know, would you please pray for me? Amen. Do they see love in you? All that they saw before in Paul was persecution. Persecution. They were all afraid, the text says. Why? Because they did not believe he was a disciple. See, they had heard of Saul's conversion, possibly. It's, it's all likely that they heard of Saul's conversion, right? But it was only by the hearing of the ear but th that they heard of his conversion, but they had experienced his persecution. And now, now is the point where Paul wants to uh, say, he wants to test and see if he can, he wants to... Uh, make an experiment and see if he can join himself to the apostles. This is just a test run. He's like, I'm going to try again, but, but here, I'm just going to try once. At, first off, like, can, can I be joined to the apostles? Will they accept me into the fellowship, understanding who I am and what I have done? Will they understand that I am now in Christ and what has been passed is past? And, the, and, and note this, the apostles are careful of him. They don't immediately say, well, you know, come on, Brother Saul. They don't just let people join up in the fellowship willy-nilly. They are protecting the body. We ought, to be, we ought to be careful to do that. We ought to be cautious not to just allow people just to come in and, and make a claim. Why is that? 
Because people come in and they're not, they're not true, they're false. Now they were worried that Paul had some kind of real big conspiracy going on that Paul, and there are people who still believe this today, that Paul is continuing on in his conspiracy. That Paul came out to uh, sneak in and corrupt what they were teaching. There are people who believe that. They are called dumb people. I don't mean that nasty, but they're just like, really, where did you get that from? I don't mean to be coarse, but come on. That, that's foolish. You think Paul was trying to corrupt the apostles? Or do you think that Paul was trying to join with the apostles? He was trying to join with them. That's the truth. Now what happens here in verse 27 is that it says, Barnabas took him. Now we all know who Barnabas is, right? Everybody knows Barnabas. Now what do we mostly know about Barnabas? We know about Barnabas as the associate of Paul. But the fact of the matter is, is that Barnabas is a upstanding man in the church up to this point. Bar and here, here's what happens. Barnabas has some years on him. Barnabas has been laboring with the church for years now. Do you get what I'm saying? Barnabas takes Paul, takes Saul, excuse me, to the disciples. Who is Barnabas? Well, Acts chapter 4 and verse 36, you don't have to turn there. It says, Joseph, or Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus. That same man, he sold what he had to give to the church. So he begins his walk with the church in a giving way. And he continues faithfully in the church... He is so faithful to this point, he has got such a confidence between him and the apostles that when he brings Saul to the apostles and declares unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, how Saul had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, that he had not just seen the Lord, but he had conversed with the Lord, and now he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. He had not just seen and spoken with the Lord, but the Lord had done something in him so that he had, he who once boldly persecuted the church so is now boldly proclaiming the church or excuse me the Christ of the church Saul was just a persecutor in their eyes but Barnabas was a helper of the church and so they trusted him and Barnabas helped them to see what Saul had become because of Jesus Christ and note this Acts 9 28 and he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. Who was he with? The, the apostles. Now, it's, it's likely that he is just with Peter and James from the reading of the text. Um, or excuse me, it's, it's, it's likely in our minds. Excuse me, I'm sorry. We, you could argue from the silence that he is with all of the apostles here. But Paul clarifies that in Galatians. And he says he went to see Peter... And he didn't see any of the other apostles except for James, the Lord's brother. So, so what that means is that here, here's a principle in hermeneutics. We let the Bible interpret the Bible. We let the Bible explain the Bible. We let the Bible define the Bible. It says here, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid and believed not that he was a disciple, but Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus, and he was with them. Who? The apostles. The implication is with all the apostles. But Paul clarifies that he only saw Peter and James, the Lord's brother. And what do they do? Is there a conflict between Peter and James and Paul? Some people would say that there is a conflict. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I think the text is clear, and he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And what does he do? He does what, what he does. How many of you have a trade in here? Raise your hand if you've got a trade. You're a tradesman or a tradeswoman. I know Tony's trade. I used to get whooped by her. Thank God I don't anymore. She about did the other day, though. Be careful going to her shop. 
you got a trade, you just do what you do. If you're in construction, you get up and you work construction. If you're an engineer, you, you get up and you do engineering stuff, whatever that is. <laughs> we got several engineers in here. I don't, you guys are high and far above beyond me. I don't know. You're in a different level. You got a trade. You just do what you do. That's just who you are. That's, that's become a part of you. A trade is not like a job. A trade is something that you have to master and you have to learn and you have to, you have to, I don't know how to say it. You have to dive into. You have to pour yourself into. Mike, you know what I'm talking about. He's a carpenter. He trained for that. He, he, he lives to do that as a part of his way of providing for his family. And Paul, what happens? Paul is so overwhelmed by the Spirit of God as Jesus Christ has pointed him to the truth and told him what things he must suffer for his name's sake, he is diving headlong into this. So as he goes to Jerusalem, he speaks boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and disputed against the Grecians. This is just what Paul does now. When I became a carpenter, I just do carpentry. They call me and they say, hey, will you do sheetrock? And I say, no, no, no. Because I don't want you to hate me. Because I are a carpenter. No sheetrock. Hey, would you do some tile? Uh, no. Really? Would you like to install a roof? No. Especially not right now. It's hot. It's not what I do, though. You know, if somebody called Saul and they said, hey, Saul, uh, we want you to come over here and we want you to um, teach history for us here at a synagogue. <laughs> Saul's going to be like, okay, let me give you the history of the scriptures, how they talk about Messiah, and he's going to preach. He's going to preach Jesus. Paul is so overwhelmed and constrained by the love of Christ that he cannot do anything but preach Jesus. What has God constrained you to do? What has God burdened your soul with? You, you don't have to be a preacher. But what has he burdened your soul with? What are you overwhelmed and consumed with in the pursuit of glorifying God and edifying the people of God and winning lost souls for Christ? I ask myself that question. I am not enough consumed with Christ. Well, you're, you're a teacher of the Word of God. You're a preacher. I am not enough consumed with the, the person, the work, the Word of Christ. I'm not, I'm not enough consumed with it. But I have a hunger and a thirst inside of me that pushes me to it, that draws me to it, sometimes drags me to it. I must know more about this man. And I must tell Jesus what I know about this man. Not what I speculate, but what I know intimately. I know that he's my redeemer. I know that he comforts the afflicted. I know that he lifts up the downhearted. I know that when my soul is weeping and in despair and, and when my soul within me is, is downhearted and all of that, that he is the lifter up of my soul. That he raises my countenance by his very countenance. And I must tell people about that. That's what I want you to know about Christ. And that without him you have nothing but hell. Both now and in eternity. He spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. They went about to slay him, the Grecians did. They did not like this. They did not love the fact that Paul was speaking, Saul was speaking boldly. They wanted to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. That's the capital of Cilicia. Okay? Tarsus is where Paul is from. That's his home synagogue. So what's he going to do? Well, what did he do in the other synagogues? He's going to go preach Jesus. Boldly. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, 
and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Note this in verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. In other words, his preaching was so potent and powerful as he's coming in and going out of Jerusalem, as he's coming in and going about this region, that these three areas, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, are experiencing unrest because of his preaching. The persecution is ramping up from the Grecians. Note this, this is not saying that the uh, Jews are persecuting. The Jews are confounded. I mean, they're dumbfounded. They're like, well, we cannot gainsay what he's saying about Christ and what he's saying about this Jesus of Nazareth. Um, we, can't, we can't overcome that. But the Grecians, they hate it. They despise it, and they want to kill him. And, and they don't care, and that's their job, and that's their goal. And they are going to weed him out by persecuting who? The church. These churches in these regions are persecuted. Unrest takes place because uh, things are happening that they don't like, the Grecians. So they run and persecute the church. Let me just say this. When the Word of God is preached faithfully, even in America, there's going to be conflict. We will not suffer persecution in the same capacity, in the same manner as the first century church or the church throughout the ages likely. Not yet. It's coming. I believe it's coming. I don't know when. I don't have a timeline. Some people got a timeline. They tell you when Jesus comes back. God help them. But here's the thing. It's going to come, except God intervenes. But when the truth is proclaimed faithfully, there's always attacks. If you don't believe there's attacks, just get on the YouTube comment section. Everybody's got something to say. I think one of the worst things about the Internet is that you used to have to have something worth saying to get a, your words published. And now all you got to do is have a camera or a computer in a YouTube account, and you can reach millions of people when a publisher would have looked at you and said, this is not worth our time. I mean, Christian or secular. Some of these people make the wildest claims. <laughs> I had one guy. I'm not trying to expose too much here, but I had one guy, and he said... You walk around in your fancy suits and you're just going to keep preaching your false gospel and get paid. And I'm like, I thank you that you think my suit is fancy because it costs $15 at Amvets. <laughs> thank you for that. And, well, I think you have a funny way of looking at things. Your mind is centered on money. I don't get paid for this. We do this willingly because God has burdened us with this. This is not for a paycheck. This is for the edifying of the body of Christ and that souls might be won. That's what we're here for. That's exactly what we're here for. So, we receive minimal persecution. And, and on the street, let me just give you an example. We were street preaching on Friday night. One of the men was standing up preaching. Our evangelist, he's, he's one of our evangelists. He's been here before, Brother Farrell. And he's preaching, and a man is approaching him, and he kind of paces when he preaches. Y'all remember that. Y'all know who I'm talking about. He's like 6'6", six, six, big guy with the face, all that stuff, preaches loud. He's out there preaching, and he kind of walks, paces as he preaches. And as he's walking, this scrawny guy, I mean, he's pretty good size. He's probably six foot tall. Scrawny guy walks up to him. And grabs him by the throat and squeezes. That's a brave guy. <laughs> he might have had a demon to be that brave. But he did. He grabbed him by the throat. Brother Dan swats his hand away. Looks like he was swatting a fly. It's a big man. And Brother Joffrey, thank God for him, he steps in. He knows martial arts and he's, he's in a position where he can help protect and, and secure the situation. And I, I'm just sitting here and thinking, we kind of had a chuckle about it because it was minimal. And I have a chuckle about the things that have happened to me, getting spit on, smoke blown in my face, punched and stuff like that, you know. We kind of we laugh at that, but, but really this is just a 
taste of what's coming. I mean, these people's hearts are wicked. And they're vile. They hate truth. They hate grace. They hate the, the mercy of God. They don't hate us. I'm pretty hateable sometimes. But they're not really hating me. They're hating the one I'm preaching about. So long as I'm doing it in the Spirit of God, that's who they're hating. So, I'm going to try and preach so well every time we go out that we get persecuted. That this church, every time I step in this pulpit, I want persecution to come. Not because I've been shock and awe and, I, and I, I've, I've been thrilling to the eyes of, of the secular people and of Gentiles and of Jews and of this and that. Not because I'm trying to be controversial. But because I'm so faithful to the truth that people can't help but having the light shine in their darkness and their darkness be revealed and they get angry at it. I want people to heckle me when I go on the streets because I need to know that the truth is going out well enough in the Spirit of God that it is pricking the hearts of sinners and provoking the demons that are out there. Because they're out there. You want, you want to see people filled with demons, you come out street preaching with us. We're going to do it once a month. You come out and see. Well, they were experiencing the persecution from the Grecians here. In Judea, in Galilee, and Samaria. And so, why is that? Because of the true preaching of the Word of God. And they had rest, though, when, Paul leave, when Saul leaves. I keep saying Paul and Saul. You know who I'm talking about, right? Say amen. 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 All right, move the congregation. There was rest. But here's the thing. They were edified by his preaching. And... Because of the edification, it provoked them to more faithfully walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And because they were edified and they were walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. Persecution upon faithful preachers is edifying. You may not like everything they say, but you are edified by their faithfulness to proclaim truth in the face of lies and error and and even I, I remember our pastor he mentioned uh, uh john MacArthur out there in california standing up against the restrictions they were finding them a thousand dollars a day they ended up with over three hundred thousand dollars or maybe more than that worth of legal fees and do you know who had to pay it the state because they won the case they refused to abide by the ruling of the state when the state said, you can't do this as a Christian. Now, you tell me I can't do something as an American. Okay, we'll talk about that. But you tell me as a Christian I can't assemble. I ain't doing that again. I don't care what you say is in the air. I'm going to meet with the body of Christ. They had rest for, for a twofold reason, because of the fear of persecution from Saul had been removed, number one, and then because the trouble which his preaching in person stirred had also been removed. Now look back at Galatians chapter 1 with me, and we're going to try and wrap this up fairly quickly. In light of the account of Luke, let's see if we can understand more fully what Paul is communicating in verse 18 through 24. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. Um, but after, but other the apostles saw in none, save James, the Lord's brother. So before the eyes of Peter and James in a matter of 15 days, Saul did more to turn Judea, Galilee, and Samaria upside down than most churches do in one community in 15 years. Just, just a little note there. And in verse 20, it seems that Paul is answering one of the accusations of the false teachers. And that is that Paul never really met with and received approval from the apostles in Jerusalem but he says this in verse 20, Now the things which I write unto you before God, behold, before God I lie not. In other words, he said, go check me out. I met with Peter. I met with James. They didn't have any problem with my preaching. They didn't have any conflict with my gospel. There was no disputing amongst us about what the truth of the gospel was. 
There was no confusion about who Christ was and about what he had done for us and why it was so important to, to, to reach the world with this message. And just for a point of reference, he says this. He says, afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So just for a point of reference, Galatia is northwest of Jerusalem. And if you were traveling to Jerusalem, then you would have to go through Cilicia and Syria to get there. So he seems to say, while you're on your way to Jerusalem to check me out, while you go down there or you send word down there and say, hey, is Paul legit? Is Paul really, is, is, is Paul really a, a, a serious apostle? Should we accept his person? You can travel through Cilicia and Syria where I was also preaching as well. And you can ask them about the power of God that fell under my preaching there. Verse 22, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they had heard only, they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth. Note this, is Paul preaching a faith? Is Paul preaching a doctrine contrary to the apostles? What does he say here? These, these faithful disciples in the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, they were already in Christ, they knew the truth of the gospel, they understood who Christ was. They had not understood that maybe that they needed to leave behind the law. They had not understood that Judaism was being faded out in a sense for the church, that there was no restriction on the church to follow Sabbaths and all this. Now, people do that, right? And that's okay. But there was no restriction. There was no rule. There was no order on the church of God to continue in that. And they're going to deal with that in Acts chapter 15. But here to this point... What is Paul doing? He's winning Gentiles to the Lord. He's winning Jews to the Lord. And, and, and here as he's doing that, they heard only about that, that he which persecuted us in time past now preacheth the faith which, he once, which once he destroyed. So he's preaching the same faith as the apostles. He is not contradicting them. He has further revelation. Remember, he has a greater understanding of the Torah, of the wisdom literature, and of the prophets. And he has a greater understanding of who Christ is as he has preached and taught in those texts. And now he has an understanding of the law and its application in their hearts and in their lives. But you notice this. If you look all throughout Acts, you don't find the apostles demanding that anybody make sure as a Christian, now as a convert to the Lord Jesus Christ, which they weren't called Christians yet then, but as people of the way, demanding like, strict adherence to the law. It was just a part of their practice. It wasn't something they had to address yet because there were not many Gentiles converted. But when Gentiles were converted, what happened to them? Were they constrained to be circumcised? We don't hear a whole lot about that. We just hear Peter saying that God made choice uh, uh, to, to win over a Gentile through me. Who was that guy's, what was his name? Come on, Bible study time. Cool, Cor. That's what I do with my kids when they don't know the end. Cornelius. Is that his name? I think it was. <laughs> if I'm wrong, it'll be funny. So, as we close here, uh, excuse me, let me read this last verse. And they glorified God in me. Who did? The churches, the apostles, the men of God, the people of God. They glorified God in Paul. Was he conflicting with what they were teaching? I think not. And that was the accusation of the people who came to Galatia saying that Paul is preaching something contradicting. Now, remember this. Galatia is, uh, the, the, the epistle to the Galatians is written after the council of Jerusalem. I'm trying to close. I promise. I'm getting ready to close. The old black preacher said. It's written just after the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council is likely 48 to 50. Galatians was written sometime in 49, 50. Depending on where the Jerusalem Council hits, it's written quickly after that is what most people agree to. Seems to be the case that that is true. If that's true, what we have here is, is Paul saying, guess what? We've already had the council. He's going to get to that in Acts chapter two, or Galatians 2. But he's prefacing that by saying, even before the council, we were in agreement. We were on the same page. We were preaching the same faith. 
I, I understood more because I had further revelation from Christ, but we were preaching the same thing as far as the person work of Christ. So first, some hermeneutical and practical points here as we close. We must interpret Scripture with Scripture. We cannot make assumptions and accusations about the differences between Paul and James and Paul and Peter without really looking at our timelines and understanding what the timeline is. There are some who in Acts chapter, or Galatians 2 are certain men came from James, but they came from him, meaning they left James and they went somewhere else to do something. First John talks about they went out from us. And what do they do? They immediately come and stir up conflict with Peter and say, Oh, Peter, you know, we came from James and uh, you ought to listen to us and this. Anyways, I've gone too far now. Let me close with this. What is your life as a Christian? What do people hear about you? Do they hear of your faith? Do they only hear of it? Do they see it? If you want a bold proclamation, you have to live it before their eyes. There's so much more that could be said, but we have to close. I've, I've gone over time. Forgive me. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that, God, you have been faithful to preserve it for us. We're so grateful for it. Now we pray that you'd bless in the preaching hour. God, give unction and authority. Uh, not because of the man, but because of the word he preaches. Not in the man, but in the word. There's the authority. We pray for that now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.